What do Snoop Doggy Dog and the incoming Democrat congressman have in common? Too much, I'm sorry to say. We will analyze their vulgar minds, particularly as it relates to that mother effer with the hat. Then Hollywood loses at the Golden Globes and the Oscars beg Kevin Hart to re-agree to host. I offer my novel solution to the awards show problem. RBG misses a day at court and the Vatican celebrates the Cuban revolution. We will analyze what other popes have had to say about the scourge of socialism. I'm Michael Knowles and this is The Michael Knowles Show. So much to get to today and I wouldn't be able to say even one single word if I didn't have these bright shiny teeth of mine. And the reason I have those bright, shiny teeth is because of Quip. The new year means new resolutions, and we've got one you are working on twice every day. It's your oral health, and with a Quip electric toothbrush, sticking to good habits is simple. The guiding features are like a built-in sports system for better brushing. So you can start a healthy routine, you can stick to it. Uh, those are two very different things. So you st- everyone wants to start it, not a lot of people keep it going. Right now, do it. Uh, Quip is superb. Uh, it's got sensitive sonic vibrations for an effective clean. It's gentle on your sensitive gums. I have sensitive gums too. Uh, It's got a built-in two-minute timer that pulses every 30 seconds to remind you when to switch sides. This one's very important because otherwise you do the thing that men do where it's like, all right, right, done. You're done in eight seconds. Probably not a good brushing. Uh, It's got a multi-use cover. It works as a stand. It mounts to mirrors. It looks really sleek and cool. And the brush heads are automatically delivered on a dentist-recommended schedule every three months for just $5. I love mine. My teeth look so much better with an electric toothbrush. I know you think you can still use a stick like you're living like a caveman in the woods. You can't. Use an electric toothbrush. This is, Quip is one of the first electric toothbrushes accepted by the American Dental Association, backed by over 25,000 dental professionals. I love it. I especially love it because it travels really easily. It's, it's much smaller than those bazookas that we used to use as electric toothbrushes. Um, and that's why over 1 million people are happy too. Uh, Quip starts at just 25 bucks. If you go to getquip.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, right now, you can get your first refill pack for free. That is your first refill pack for free at G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. Check it out. We've talked about a lot of political analysts recently. We've talked about all the great journals of political thought, all of the talking heads, all of the pundits. We haven't, unfortunately, checked in yet with one of the great political philosophic minds of our time, Snoop Diggity Doodog, who has some thoughts on the government shutdown. All you people for the federal government that got getting, not getting paid right now, ain't no fucking way in the world y'all can vote for Donald Trump when he come back up again. If, it is, if y'all do vote for him, y'all some stupid mother. I'm saying that to y'all early. All you federal government people that's not being paid, that's being treated unfairly right now, not being paid, that's so terrible. And this punk mother don't care. So I'm saying that to say this. When they get back on and y'all get your jobs back and it's time to vote, don't vote for that. Please don't. Look what he do. He just don't give a. Y'all honest, blue collar, hardworking people and suffering. So if he don't care about y'all, he really don't give a fuck about us. So f*** him too. And f*** everybody down with Donald Trump. I said a year, Snoop Dogg, f*** him. Mm, really profound, really, really thoughtful, I would say, Snoop Dogg's uh, take on the government shutdown. Because nobody speaks for honest, hardworking, blue-collar Americans quite like Snoop Doggy Dog, an accused murderer, dri- accused drive-by shooter. He got off by that on the way. He, he, he got off on the drive-by shooting charge, on the murder charge, although the jury was hung on his manslaughter charge. Uh, nobody, nobody really speaks for those hardworking blue-collar Americans, quite like a guy who's wearing probably $50,000 worth of gold chains around his neck, who gets paid to just swear and curse on, uh, on songs. I, I put songs in quotes that nobody really, that's the voice of America. That's it. That's it. That's, that's, so you have that on one side and then you've got Donald Trump. I really like it because obviously if somebody like Snoop Dogg running his mouth like that, he makes Donald Trump look polite. But you might say, Michael, you know, you're really being unfair here. This is an unfair comparison to compare the president of the United States to some stupid rapper, some guy who runs his mouth and, you know, was involved with gangs and all that's, that's not a fair comparison. Okay. Okay, that's fair enough. Let's compare what Snoop Dogg said to what the incoming Democrat Congressman Rashida Tlaib had to say. And when your son looks 
at you and says, Mama, look, you won. Bullies don't win. And I no. said, baby, they don't. Because we're going to go in there, we're going to impeach the mother <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's exactly the same. Okay. I, which was which? I don't know. Was that Congresswoman Snoop Diggity Doo Dog? Is that who that was? I don't know. There is uh, now no difference now between... Uh, profane rappers and members of Congress. And there actually is something of a symmetry here because I don't want to let Donald Trump off the hook entirely. Donald Trump is a product of the popular culture. And so what's going on, it's not just showing how tawdry and despicable the Democrats are, although that's part of it. What it's showing is uh, the effect of culture on politics. So Donald Trump is a product of this popular culture, and he's helped shape the popular culture. He's been on TV. We've known him for decades and decades. And by the way, he was a hip-hop icon for decades as well. His name was referenced in hip-hop songs all the time until he ran for president as a Republican. And so you've got him affecting that culture a little bit. He's, he's had a little bit of a loose mouth, you might say, although he's been much less profane since he's been elected president, which is very nice. And now you see uh, the culture following that and reacting to that, even though the culture caused that. And you see Democrat congressmen trying to follow suit. And what this really is, is a symptom of something that's grown for a long time, which is people trying to do Donald Trump who are not Donald Trump. This doesn't work. A lot of people, they see Donald Trump is this anomaly. He's this crazy cultural figure. And, it, and w- when he talks loose and he uses humor and he's a little flippant in his language, that really works for him. So they all try to do it too, but they can't do it because they're not Donald Trump. Do you remember when little Marco tried to do it? He called me Mr. Meltdown. Let me tell you something. Last night in the debate during one of the breaks, two of the breaks, he went backstage. He was having a meltdown. First, he had this little makeup thing applying, like, makeup around his mustache because he had one of those sweat mustaches. Then, then he asked for a full-length mirror. I don't know why, because the podium goes up to here, but he wanted a full-length mirror. Maybe to make sure his pants weren't wet. I don't know. Then... Now, I call him Little Marco. I, I actually kind of like Marco Rubio, but, but there, he's Little Marco. When he's trying to be Donald Trump and failing. That's when he becomes Little Marco. He's not Little Marco before. He's actually a pretty smart guy. He's a pretty good senator. But when he does that, he becomes Little Marco. He degrades himself when he tries to do this rickle shtick that he can't do. Only Donald Trump can do it. Why can Donald Trump do it? Because we've known him for a very long time. And because he's a showbiz guy. So, and show business is a skill. It's a real skill being able to be on camera and knowing how to work with television, knowing how to get a reaction from a live audience. These are the skills that show business teaches you. Donald Trump's been in it for a very long time. And we know him. We know that when he says a swear word, or we know that when he speaks flippantly or he uses an insult, we know what that means and we know what that doesn't mean. We know that he's not some vicious murderer, killer guy. We know he's not some, uh, we just, he is what he is. He's Donald Trump. He's, uh, over the weekend, I was at a friend's house and for Christmas, they got me Trump the game. This is a board game that came out and it's like Monopoly, but way shadier, (laughs) you know, kind of way more chaotic. It's actually a very fun game. And this game though, it didn't come out in 2016. Didn't come out in 2005 when, when The Apprentice was on the air. That game came out in 1989. So at least as far back as 1989, there was a, there was a game of, with Donald Trump's face on it. This guy has been in the popular consciousness for so long, so he can get away with a lot more. We haven't known Marco Rubio that long. Who is Marco Rubio? He kind of came up, what, five, seven, eight years ago, maybe we started to hear about him. That's not long enough. Rashida Tlaib, what do we know about Rashida Tlaib? We know she's an anti-Semite. We know that she has suggested that, that, uh, uh, certain Jews have dual citizenship or rather dual, dual loyalty and not full loyalty to their country. We know that she supports the BDS movement, boycott, divest, and sanction Israel. She wants Israel wiped off the map. She, and she literally wiped Israel off the map. In her congressional office, she went to a map of the world. She took a sticky note, wrote the word Palestine on it, and covered up Israel. She put it right. She actually, in a symbolic way, wiped Israel off of the map. That's what we know about her. So when she says things like this, when she uses words like mother F or, or whatever, it's received very differently. When Trump does it, a guy that we've known for 40 years, we think, oh, that's kind of funny. 
all right, nothing's going to rock the boat, but that's, uh, okay, oh, that's just Trump being Trump. When this random anti-Semite that we've just met, I mean, she just got into the popular consciousness, comes out and starts screaming mother effer about our president, we take that very differently. That could be a dangerous thing, especially when she wants to wipe a U.S. ally off of the map. Uh, that's why it doesn't work. She's not the only one, by the way, who, uh, who has been guilty of this. You know my, my good friend, my, my old neighbor, I, I call her, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She has been getting in the news constantly. And I've got to tell you, she's been saying very stupid things. We will talk about all of those. We will answer all of her very stupid and dangerous points. But I got to give her credit. She's really good at politics. She's really good at it. She is, I've said it for a long time, she's a shrewd politician. She is a freshman congresswoman. She has accomplished zero in her life before getting elected to Congress. She's lied about her upbringing. She, she wasn't doing anything. She was a community organizer and she was working as a bartender to pay the bills for a, a little bit before she ran for Congress. Voting records show that she was still living with her parents until 2016 up in Northern Westchester. A woman of zero accomplishment has dominated the national and sometimes international news. That requires immense skill. It's what makes her dangerous. And it's what makes her ignorance dangerous. And it was what makes her ideology dangerous. Here is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez talking about how she's going to pay for her awful socialist programs to Anderson Cooper. How are you going to pay for all of this? No one asks how we're going to pay for this space force. No one asked how we paid for a $2 trillion tax cut. We only ask how we pay for it on issues of housing, health care, and education. How do we pay for it? With the same exact mechanisms that we pay for military increases, for the Space Force, for all of these uh, ambitious policies. There are Democrats, obviously, who are worried about your effect on the party. Democratic Senator Chris Kuhn said about left-leaning Democrats, if the next two years is just a race to offer increasingly unrealistic proposals, it'll be difficult for us to make a credible case we should be allowed to govern again. What makes it unrealistic? How to pay for it. We pay more per capita in health care and education for lower outcomes than many other nations. And so for me, what's unrealistic is, is what we're living in right now. Yes and no. Some of what she said is true. Very little, but some of it is true. She talks about per capita healthcare spending uh, r- with regard to advanced socialist economies like the United Kingdom. One thing we have to remember is that the entire rest of the world depends on American healthcare innovation. They are all free riders on our healthcare innovation. When that engine of innovation goes away, when all those drugs that we develop go away, their healthcare regimes see their costs skyrocket and they say the quality of care decrease. All of those other regimes also have much lower quality of care. They have much longer wait times. People die waiting in line for surgery. That doesn't happen here in the United States or doesn't need to happen here in the United States. And most jarringly for human dignity, you have the cases like little Alfie Evans, like other uh, little babies that we've seen just in the United Kingdom who were sick, who had conditions where their parents wanted to take them out of the government hospital, take them to the United States, take them to Italy, take them elsewhere for treatment. And the government said no. There was one case where the parents wanted to take the baby out of the hospital and bring the baby. The the Pope said the baby could come to to a hospital next to the Vatican and they would uh, arrange for Italian citizenship and they would make it all happen. And the government said no. Your baby is going to stay here and die. You have no right to try to save your baby's life. That's socialism. That's socialist medicine. To say nothing of the tax rates in some of these places. So uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez points to uh, some countries that have socialist healthcare regimes. She says, look, it works fine there. There are some reasons why in, in some ways it does work there. But one reason is extraordinarily high tax rates. And now Alexandria is talking about raising the tax rates to 70%, effectively 82.7% on people in places like New York or California. She's throwing a lot of this out there. She is going full socialist, full hog against the wall. We could spend, I suppose we should spend at full shows talking about why socialist health care doesn't work, why it's so bad for human dignity, why the economics don't work, why it especially wouldn't work if the United States uh, were to enact it. But suffice it to say for now, I just want to point out this one trick that she is using that uh, socialists use all the time. Anderson Cooper says, how are you going to pay for this health care program, which will cost $40 trillion over 10 years? And she says, well, the same way we're going to pay for Space Force. 
Now, you've heard, Space Force is this program Donald Trump talked about, a new branch of the military to deal with outer space. When people hear that, they say, okay, there's one government program, Space Force, and there's another government program, Socialist Healthcare. And if you can pay for one, you can pay for the other, right? Wrong. The cost of Space Force is estimated to be $13 billion over five years. It's hard to predict out what health or what, what costs will be, particularly in a, in a military program like that. But let's just double it. Let's just say that it's $26 billion over 10 years. You've got $26 billion over 10 years for Space Force, and you've got $40 trillion over 10 years for health care. You are talking about a difference of not just an order of magnitude, but almost twice an order of magnitude. And yet when people hear these numbers, it's all the same. If it ends in Ilion, it's all the same. If the number is bigger than a thousand, it's all the same. When, when you hear million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, quintillion, zazillion, you know intellectually that there's a difference. But in your mind, when you're visualizing it, you don't visualize the difference. And I don't know if Ocasio is extraordinarily ignorant, she might be, or if she's being obtuse here and being crafty and clever to try to ram through this awful healthcare system of hers. But that's the trick she's playing on. She thinks that you don't know the difference between a billion and a trillion. The difference between a billion and a trillion is a full order of magnitude. It's a bunch of zeros. And so... Uh, even just consider our annual budget for Syria. She says, where are we going to get the money for Space Force? Our military actions in Syria cost about $15 billion per year. Space Force will cost $13 billion over five years. So one year, t- pulling the troops out of Syria, which President Trump has said he's going to do, one year will more than pay for five years of Space Force. What would we have to do to pay for Ocasio's healthcare regime? We would have to double tax receipts to the federal government, which by the way, isn't even as simple as doubling the income tax rate. What is the income tax rate now? Effectively, you could be paying 40%, over 40% in effective uh, taxes when you factor in state and local and all the other stuff. But it's not even that simple because when you raise taxes that high, you, de, uh, you disincentivize people working in the economy. You disincentivize production. So f- just to use a, an example that she keeps bringing up, if you raise the tax rate to 70% federal on someone even making $10 million, uh, then you've got to take into effect uh, state and local. Let's say it raises that to 82.7% if you live in New York. Why would you ever make more than $10 million? Why, you would have no incentive to do it when you know that the vast majority of all that money will be confiscated. So you have two choices. You can either hide the money, figure out some crafty way to get the money uh, out of the country or hide it in some sleight of hand on the accounting books, or you just don't do it. Why would I ever work 83% of the year for the federal government? Ain't going to happen, baby. No chance. So uh, that, that distance, I mean, this is, this is also what destroys socialist economies is that you, you just have no incentive to be productive whatsoever. We are a wonderful engine of growth because Americans are productive. But if you start confiscating all our wealth, guess what? We're not going to be productive at all. Now, when you point out these things, when you point out mathematical reality, to say nothing of moral realities, mathematical realities, political realities of socialism, this is Ocasio's best response that she can muster. The criticisms of you is that your math is fuzzy. The Washington Post recently awarded you four Pinocchios oh my goodness. for uh, misstating some statistics about Pentagon spending. If people want to really blow up one figure here or one word there, I would argue that they're missing the forest for the trees. I think that there's a lot of people more concerned about being precisely, factually, and semantically correct than about being morally right. But being factually correct is important. It's absolutely important. And whenever I make a mistake, I say, okay, this was clumsy. And then I restate what my point was. Um, but it's, it's not the same thing as the president lying about immigrants. It's not the same thing at all. The, just listen to what she said. She said, some people are focused on being factually and semantically correct rather than being morally right. Now, this is the second trick that socialists always use that Ocasio is using here, which is false dichotomies to create a false uh, couple of choices. To be morally right requires that you be correct. She seems not to understand that the word semantics means 
meaning itself. It means the meaning of words. So to be factually right, correct is to be right. It, they're, they're synonymous. To be right with regard to the meaning of real things. To be morally correct is to be right. It's to be right with regard to the, the meaning of real things. Part of what she's doing here, and I think this comes actually out of her ideology and out of her culture, is she's speaking as though truth doesn't matter. I mean, there, she is literally saying truth doesn't matter. She says it doesn't matter if you are factually correct as long as you're morally right. Of course, that sentence doesn't mean anything. That's like gobbledygook. It's like saying blah, 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 blah. It's like saying it, it, you don't need to be correct as long as you're correct. Blah, 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 blah. It's all that Orwellian double talk that she has. But I think in her ideology, which is totally relativistic, this is true. You can just say things regardless of what they mean, regardless, because as, as long as it has the intended political effect, you've achieved your goal. She doesn't care about saying true things. She doesn't care how she's going to pay for 40 trillion dollars. All she cares about is the political effect of her in government taking over health care. She wants to take more power for the government, power away from people, because she is totally confident. She has the faith and the zeal of a convert for her religion, which is socialism, that once the government all has all that power, everything will be fine. As long as we don't have all that freedom out there for people to make their own choices, as long as we take that back, we'll work out everything in the end. That'll just be accounting. This is completely morally obtuse. This is completely wrong. There is right and there is wrong. There is truth and there is falsehood. Those are real things. They're not relative. They're not subjective constructs. You know, Ben often has, has that phrase, facts don't care about your feelings. This is the inverse of that. This is exactly the opposite. She's saying, my feelings don't care about your facts. I don't care if you are factually correct. And of course, uh, uh, Anderson Cooper was the one who, who just sort of let her get away with it. He pushed back very slightly, but he let her get away with it. This is what is so wicked about it. And we'll get to, uh, in a minute, how the Vatican was celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Cuban communist revolution, how perverse that is. Many popes have realized how perverse that is. Socialism is a perversity. It is anti-human. And this is what it's all about. It's not just about raising your taxes. It's not just even about taking away your health care choices or your employment choices or your labor choices or whatever. What, it's, what this is about is lies versus reality. It's about that quote that Democrats always say on the campaign trail. They quote Shaw when he says, some people see the world as it is and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask why not. They forget that those words that Shaw wrote were in the mouth of the serpent tempting Eve in the garden from a play called Back to Methuselah. That's what it boils down to. Ocasio is completely right to talk about moral correctness, to say this is not just an issue of physical realities, this is an issue of moral and metaphysical realities. It's true. Socialism is all about morality. It's all about ethics. These systems of e e economies that we're talking about, ultimately this is a moral question, this is a religious question, this is an ethical question, and socialism is anti-human. It is wrong, it is rotten down to its core, it is a scourge and a pest and a plague on humanity. And we should talk about it in those terms. We will in just a minute, but we do have to cover more of the government shutdown uh, because th this, is, this is the big political question that nobody's talking about because nobody's feeling it. Dick Durbin, major uh, Senate Democrat, points this out. He sees no end in sight for the shutdown. From what you're describing, it doesn't sound like there is any progress. How close are we to ending this shutdown? Well, I can't say that we're close because the president's made it clear he doesn't care. Uh, he's prepared to see a shutdown for months, and he even said years, and reaffirmed that before the cameras. Uh, it was stunning to hear a president of the United States say that about his own government, a government we elected him to lead. Uh, but that is his position. It's, nobody cares. Nobody cares is the issue. That's the big problem. This government shutdown thus far has been a major win for Trump. Don't just take my word for it. Look at the public polling. There was a poll out from Rasmussen, which is a right-leaning polling firm, but they, they get things right a lot of the time. It showed that only 6% of Americans say that this shutdown has had a major impact on their lives. Now, of course, nobody watching this show or listening to this show, I, I, I bet 0% of people watching or listening say that the shutdown has had a major impact on your lives. Even if you work for the federal government, even if you're a federal employee who's not being paid right now, you know you're going to get back pay. There's a little bit of a pinch in the short term and 
everybody's really sorry for that. Nobody wants people who are working not to be paid. But every, everyone knows after every government shutdown, the workers get paid. Uh, they get paid for all the time that they weren't being paid. And actually, even employees who called in sick, which is happening to a slightly higher degree right now, even they get paid. So it, ultimately, workers end up actually usually getting more money because of the shutdown than they would otherwise. Uh, but So you see 6% who say that this shutdown has had a major impact on their lives. 21% say they didn't even know that there's a shutdown going on right now. So more than three times that number of people aren't even aware that there is a shutdown because we don't feel it at all. Even the national parks aren't really closing. Very little is happening right now. You can still go to the airport. You can still travel. Everything is going uh, basically just fine. Now, this isn't going to last forever. Uh, Donald Trump has said that he'll let this thing go on for months or even years. And because he's pursued this madman strategy in office, because he's doing things that seem erratic, he's always keeping his opponents on their toes. Maybe he means it. Maybe he's really willing to do that. As you approach tax season, you're going to see two arguments here. If the government, by some very sm slim chance, were still going uh, if the shutdown were still going on at that point, because you've got a lot of Americans who prepay their taxes and they'll get a, a refund at tax time. They'll be upset if they don't get it. As for me, I don't do that. I, I pay my taxes when tax time is due. I refuse to give the government an advance on, on that that's money or, or uh, much of an advance on the money that I'll owe them uh, when tax time comes around. So actually, I'm all for it. Keep the IRS shut down. I'm going to owe them money. I don't want to pay them their money. Works for me. But uh, what's going to happen? I mean, you've still got a lot of agencies funded for the next month, even for the next two months. So Trump has a lot of leeway here. You're already starting to see cracks among Democrats. Nancy Pelosi says the wall is immoral. Other Democrat reps are breaking with her and saying, well, it's not immoral. We all have walls around our houses. The Vatican has a wall around uh, around it. Uh, you we wouldn't say that's immoral. We've got Every other country has a wall. You wouldn't say that's immoral. Uh, you, Democrats 10 years ago were voting for parts of the wall anyway. So I think you're starting to see a crack there. You're not really seeing a crack from the White House. I think as it stands right now, there's a good chance we win this battle. It won't be the end of the line because with $5 billion, you're not going to be able to build the whole wall. You're only going to be able to build a, a part of it. But it looks like it's moving in our direction. Uh, all of the polling shows it's still going well. I hope President Trump doesn't miss his opportunity here. At a certain point, those poll numbers are going to reverse. But right now, things are looking very good. Now, I know, I know that you were all, you're all waiting with bated breath to hear what I think about the Golden Globes. You watched it, didn't you? Did you? You didn't? Oh, me neither. That's okay. I watched clips of it. And I've got a novel solution for the awards show problem. We'll also talk about uh, the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Revolution and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who for the first time is missing court oral arguments because of a medical problem. I wonder what that means for 2019. We will get to it. But first, go to dailywire.com. You have to do it. You have to subscribe. Give us your money. Keep me in employment. You know, at all times, Ben is waiting outside the door, waiting to hand me my pink slip if we don't make money from the, from the uh, subscribers and viewers. Don't give him the satisfaction. Go to dailywire.com. It's 10 bucks a month, $100 for an annual membership. You get me. You get the Andrew Clavin Show. You get the Ben Shapiro Show. You get the Matt Walsh Show. You get another kingdom. You get to ask questions in the mailbag coming up on Thursday. You get to ask questions in backstage, which is happening a lot now. You get, you get so much. You get so much. But this is what matters. This is what mother effing matters. You know, I, I'm not good at talking like a leftist. I can't, it doesn't, it sounds weird when I do it, but get it. I, but I, I want the enthusiasm of it. And, and you'll be really enthusiastic about your leftist tears tumbler because if we build this wall, Oh, you're going to need, if you, if we build this wall, we're also going to get a moat and you're going to need the leftist tears tumbler to fill it up and float on top of it. Go to dailywire.com. We will be right back with a lot more. The Golden Globes were last night. Don't care, me neither. But I actually do care for what it means about the culture. Obviously, no one's watched most of these movies. No one cares what these celebrities think about anything. But uh, th there was an amazing opening monologue, and it showed you just how far our popular culture has fallen. It was truly astounding. Here is just a little bit of it. Now, some of you may be wondering why the two of us are hosting together. And the reason is, we're the only two people left in Hollywood who haven't gotten in trouble for saying something offensive. Oh, ooh, Sandra, that reminds me. You know what race of people really gets under my skin? Uh, Andy. The Hollywood half marathon. 
Because it messes up all the traffic, you know? Oh, yeah. I hate that race of people. It's the worst race of people. Now we know what you guys are thinking. Andy Samberg and Sandra Oh, the two nicest people in showbiz, this thing's gonna be a snooze. But not so fast, because you fools are all about to get roasted. Gervais style. Mm -hmm. Hope you're wearing your flip flops, Hollywood, because we're about to scorch some earth. Damn right, rip it, Andy. All right, who we got, who we got? Well, if it isn't Spike Lee, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Do the Right Thing. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you who does the right thing. You, as a director, lifetime fan, can't wait to see what you do next. Bam, face. Brutal. So it goes on like this for uh, 10 or 11 minutes. It, uh, they go on, the whole joke being here that they can't say anything mean or offensive because they'll lose their entire careers. And Andy Samberg is actually pretty funny. He's, he's a little hit or miss, but he, he does have a real co comic skill. Sandra O oh does not. She isn't funny. She wasn't even funny at this shtick. But what's interesting about this shtick is it's obviously they're kind of joking about how intense the Hollywood uh, uh, PC culture has gotten, that they can only say nice things. But then they just only say nice things. So it would, if they had joked about that and then there were some break, there were some turn, there were some challenge to that PC culture, which is so unfunny, then I think it would have really worked. But they didn't do that. They just kept saying nice things, which was the most cowardly thing they could have possibly done. They actually had to hide their cowardliness in a joke about how cowardly they were, but then they never broke out of it. So it just remained cowardly. The, the, that is the whole point. They had to have two presenters. If they only had one presenter, that's too big a target. They had to have a man and a woman. If they had two men, that, well, you couldn't do that. They had to have them be of different races. If it were two white people, that, you couldn't possibly do that. And, but then they just indulge the whole thing. And then the, the, the most pathetic part of all of it was they actually turned it, they made an earnest turn at the very end. And Sandra Oh gave an impassioned, earnest political speech about what I have no idea. I said yes to the fear of being on this stage tonight because, because I wanted to be here to look out into this audience and witness this moment of change. And I'm not fooling myself. I'm not fooling myself. Next year could be different, it probably will be. But right now, this moment is real. Trust me, it is real. Because I see you. <laughs> and I see you. All these faces of change. And now, so will everyone else. Oh, it's so awkward oh, because they don't, I mean, this whole shtick that Sandra O oh is doing is so poorly performed. I mean, it's so ridiculous and over the top and obviously disingenuous that even the audience there, all of whom have been indoctrinated in the PC culture, they all know how to perform. They all know that they're supposed to abide by certain PC uh, orthodoxies. They start laughing. You hear the oh, she is, and I know it's real. She's mustering all that fake, all those fake tears. You never see the tears run down her face, obviously, because she's not a very good actress. She goes, I, and, I, and, and I know it's real because I see you. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is, yeah, we're here. We've, always, we've been here. Uh -huh. We were here last year, too. And so the, the, a couple people, more than a couple people in the audience start laughing. But then they cut it off really quickly because, no, she is performing. She's do People do this on stage sometimes. They, uh, and women do it obviously more than men do. They muster up this like fake crying emotional thing. And it just is really pathetic. I mean, this was really, really sad. What is she referring to? She said change is here. There's ch is she referring to the sexual assault stuff? How every Every one of these Hollywood degenerates is raping everybody else. Is that what she's referring to? But there's change now because we're wearing buttons on our lapels. And there's change because we have, we have bracelets on our wrist about time's up. And so it's changed now. Is that what you, or is she referring to racial questions that certain races weren't being cast a lot in Hollywood and now they're being cast a little more? Is it race or is it, or is it about the hosts or the women, multiple hosts or why don't, what, watching this, all I could think of was one of the greatest PSAs that has ever been aired. Uh, it's a satirical PSA that was put up by Clickhole to take the pledge. 
I've always wanted to be part of something bigger than myself. To make a difference. You go through life and you see all this injustice, but you never really do anything about it. You don't know how. I have two little kids, so I'm always thinking about their future. Every solution begins with just one person stepping up and taking responsibility. That's why I'm taking the pledge. I'm taking the pledge because I care about my community. For my kids. My grandchildren. For you. For me. For us. For us, for them, and for me too. Because I care about the future, and not just my future, but the future of everyone. Every single person. My baby boys. Taking the pledge is about standing up for what matters and what's right. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, anyone can take the pledge. I got my brother to take the pledge, and he got his friend to do it. I got everyone in my school to take the pledge. You get her to take the pledge, and she gets someone else who gets someone else, and on and on and on. And suddenly, we've got something much bigger than any one of us. Take the pledge, Golden Globes. Go out there and take the pledge. This isn't just bad for comedy when, when they try to do this earnestly. This is also, I mean, th this leads to terrible leftist politics. It points out something that I, I try to, I noticed this about the particularly hipster millennials, but this is true of the left broadly. There is a culture now that's taken over comedy for the last 30 years probably, which is irony. Now all of comedy is centered around irony. Before it wasn't centered around irony and, and specifically ironic apathy that we're all just, everything's just to be debunked and deconstructed and everything's really lame and really super cool and I don't care and I don't mind, I don't need to be excited and I'm, it doesn't matter, I'm just apathetic and everything's totally ironic. That culture of comedy has been around since at least, it's at least Letterman. And he sort of heralded that change. And sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's not. But the, the thing with irony, if you live your life entirely ironically, hipsters getting stupid tattoos because they look stupid, ironically getting certain tattoos. The thing with irony is that if you live your life entirely ironically, then there's no such thing as irony. Then you're doing it earnestly. If you tell these jokes the jokes about how we have to only say nice things about everyone at the Golden Globes. And then that's all you do. It's no longer ironic. You're doing it earnestly. And, and this is true even of these, you know, every award show has awful political speeches nowadays over the last 15 years. And uh, Christian Bale gave a, a truly ridiculous one last night. Thank you to that geezer over there, Adam. He said, he said, uh, he said, I've got to find somebody who can, who can be absolutely charisma free and reviled by everybody. So he went, that's got to be Bale in it, you know. Thank you. And uh, through all the competition, I will be uh, cornering the market on uh, charisma free. What do you think? Mitch McConnell next? That could be good, wouldn't it? Um, uh, thank you to uh, Satan for giving me inspiration on how to play this role. Uh, some people are confused hearing that because we never hear Christian Bale with his actual accent. And Christian Bale is English. He was raised in Wales to English parents. And so that's his real accent. And he's talking about playing Dick Cheney in the movie Vice. And he's calling him a charisma free blankety blank. And he thanks Satan for giving him uh, inspiration to play the role. Something I just want to point out here. In awards shows, when you won an Oscar or a Golden Globe, you used to thank God. You used to get up there, and I want to thank my friends and my family, my directors, and I want to thank God for, for being there and sustaining me and inspiring me. Now you thank Satan. Now these people are thanking Satan. And you might say, well, he was telling a joke. Well, it's ironic. Well, it's, it's this and that. Right. If you live I ironically 100% of the time, then the irony isn't irony anymore. It's earnest. And, and this guy is actually getting up there and thanking Satan. You know something has gone seriously wrong with these awards shows when you get up there and thank Satan. By the way, just a little point on Christian Bale. Christian Bale was arrested in 2008 for domestic violence against his mother and sister. And he's going after Dick Cheney as this charisma-free blankety blank who's inspired by Satan. Maybe one should look in the mirror. Maybe Mr. Bale should pluck the uh, plank out of his own eye before looking at the speck in his neighbor's eye. But unsurprisingly, in early ratings right now, the, this Golden Globe show was down at, to a four-year low, maybe a decade low. It was down over last year. The ratings are plummeting for these awards shows, and they're plummeting especially for the Oscars. You remember that blow-up. They chose Kevin Hart, the comedian, to host the Oscars. Then they found that he made a gay joke 10 years ago. So there was this big fake 
faux outrage uproar, a huge non-troversy, and the Academy uh, basically sold him out, and Kevin Hart decided he wasn't going to host the Oscars anymore. Now they're in a bind because there's no one to host the Oscars. If the new standard is that if you've ever told a gay joke, you can't host the Oscars, then no comedian ever can host the Oscars. And beyond that, no human being walking on this earth can host the Oscars. Everybody has told a gay joke. Everybody's heard a gay joke. Everybody's laughed at a gay joke. And if you say that you haven't, you're lying. Ellen DeGeneres, I am certain, has told many gay jokes in her life. And she had Kevin Hart on to basically ask him on behalf of the Academy to come back and host the Oscars. Here she is begging. So I... I called the Academy today Mm because I I really want you to host the Oscars. I think that I was so excited when I heard that they asked you. I thought it was an amazing thing. I knew how important it was and how it was a dream. So I called them. I said, Kevin's on. I have no idea if he wants to come back and host, but what are your thoughts? And they were like, oh, my God, we we want him to host. We feel like that maybe he misunderstood or it was handled wrong or maybe we said the wrong thing, but we want him to host. Whatever we can do, we would be thrilled. And he should host the Oscars. I mean, I, I, I mean, the, the Academy is, is saying, what can we do to make this happen? Yeah, I bet they are, because now they're up a certain creek without a paddle, and they've got no one that they can possibly use. I have a novel bit of advice for this award show problem. This is my advice to the Academy, if you're watching. Let Oscar die. Put him out of his misery. Stop airing it. This this has been building for a very long time. The awards show is insufferable. That's why nobody is watching it. The Oscars ratings were at a 44-year low last year, and that was a 20% drop over the previous year. It is dying. It is dead. The reason it is dead is not because it had to die, but because those awful people in the Academy have made it die. They've made it all about politics. They've made it all about leftist politics, and also because the movie business is dead. The uh, movies that win awards at the Oscars Oscars, nobody has ever seen. The movies that people go and see, the three movies a year, all of which are superhero movies, are not winning Oscars, and they don't deserve to win Oscars because they're not very good movies. So uh, it's it's dead. It's over. Kill it. Move on. Stop trying to resuscitate this zombie of Oscar. He was glorious in his day. The American uh, film industry was glorious in its day, and now it's dead, and you killed it. You should look in the mirror and feel deep shame about that, and then move on because it's over. Um, the Cuban Revolution. I have to get to this. It's the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Revolution. Uh, and the, the Vatican, of all places, the Vatican News Service, honored that Cuban Revolution. It sent out a post. It said, quote, the Cuban Revolution celebrated its 60th anniversary this January 1st, 2019. On the island, the historic anniversary was celebrated with a ceremony in Santiago de Cuba in the cemetery of Santa Ifigenia, where Fidel Castro is buried, who died November 25th, 2016, to the main national forces Uh, The dictator Fulgencio Batista fled on uh, 26 months of guerrilla war led by brothers Fidel and Raul Castro. Fidel Castro proclaimed the beginning of the revolution, the victory of the counterculture. It is celebrating this. The Vatican News Service, speaking for the Vatican, is celebrating the Cuban revolution. This is awful. This is horrific. Thankfully, they took down that post. The, the church needs to stop this. The church needs to stop playing footsie with socialists. The Pope has done it. The Vatican has done it in recent years. This is a major break with uh, church history. This is a major break with uh, the, the spirit of Christianity. It's wrong. It's anti-human, and they need to stop doing it. Broadly, uh, Protestant churches as well need to stop doing this. There is a, a sense now pushed by hippy dippy left wingers that Jesus was just a really nice hippy socialist and we've all perverted his message because he was such a socialist. This is not true. Uh, just a few statistics on the Cuban revolution 60 years later. In the last 10 years, there have been at least 18,000 political prisoners in Cuba. It's hard to get accurate numbers, obviously, because it's a totalitarian regime, but that's a good estimate. Two million Cubans live outside of Cuba because of the hell that the Castros inflicted. I went down to Cuba. I I visited there when it was briefly semi-open. I talked to a lot of Cubans. Let me tell you something. They don't wear Che Guevara t-shirts in Cuba. They wear American flags sewn onto their clothing and on their bicycles when they can afford them. That is the protest because they want freedom and they hate communism because communism is slavery and it is 
truly destroyed that people. Uh, we know that the Castro regime death toll is estimated between 35 and 141,000 people. We know 5,000 people were executed immediately after the Castro takeover to say nothing of the fact that the communist regime in Cuba almost blew up the entire world during the Cuban Missile Crisis. There's nothing moral about socialism. There's nothing good about socialism. It's awful, it's wicked, and it's anti-human. By, by the way, as, as the Vatican applauds and celebrates the Cuban Revolution, don't forget that the Cuban Revolution specifically attacked Christianity. It was an atheistic revolution. A lot of Catholics, including a bishop, were permanently exiled from the, uh, from the country. This after the Vatican and Pope Francis has asked earlier in the year two underground Chinese bishops to step down in favor of uh, government communist party apparatchik bishops. We know that the Pope has regularly attacked capitalism and free markets. We need a, a to counter this. We, we finally must counter this as it affects, in this case, specifically the Catholic Church, but Protestant churches as well. Socialism is wicked and terrible, and it must be opposed vigorously. John Paul II knew this very well. In his encyclical Centesimus Annus, he wrote, quote, it would appear that on the level of individual nations and of international relations, the free market is the most efficient instrument for utilizing resources and effectively responding to needs. A pope before him, Leo XIII, also wrote even more clearly about socialism. He referred to socialists as a wicked confederacy. He referred to them as a pest, an evil growth. He said socialists steal the very gospel itself with a view to deceive more easily the unwary. He called it a plague. That's exactly what it is. That's what we should call it when we talk about the 60th anniversary of the Cuban revolution. That's how we should talk about it when we respond to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, another young, attractive, very likable woman who's trying to push this plague and this pest and this wicked evil growth on humanity again. This old, decrepit, awful idea that will not die. We need to fight it. We need to fight it in the strongest terms, and we should give no quarter to people who are, are trying constantly to resuscitate that awful zombie plague. All right, that's our show. We've run out of time. We'll get to more tomorrow. In the meantime, I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. I'll see you soon. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Senia Villarreal. Executive producer, Jeremy Bory. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer, Mathis Glover. And our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Jim Nickel. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire Forward Publishing production. Copyright Forward Publishing 2018.